Greetings and, and welcome to the 24th now of our town hall series. It's great as always to see each of you. And uh, as always, I wanna thank the members of our Society for Leading Medicine, the chairs of the society, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Finkelstein and Caroline, as well as Catherine and George Masterson. Um, you're all deeply appreciated. So thank you for all of your hard work and support. You know, this is now, I guess, the third that we've been able to do this year where we've really shifted our focus almost entirely away from COVID, which is so nice. Um, and of course, we'll talk a little bit about COVID today, but the vast majority we get to focus today on something very, very important. And that's the Linda K. and David M. Underwood Center for Digestive Disorders. This is one of our flagship programs here at Houston Methodist. Um, you know, overall, we're ranked number 16 in US News and World Report, have 10 specialties that bring us those rankings, as well as a number of sort of fundamentals that, that result in that. Um, the Underwood Center is actually ranked number 10 in the country out of about 4,500 hospitals. So really a stellar, stellar program here. Thanks to stellar people like the people here with me today. Those people today are Dr. Eamon Quigley, who's the director of the Underwood Center, but I've also got Dr. Rachel Schieser on my right and Dr. David Victor on my left, uh, who will be sharing uh, a lot of their expertise with us today. If you have questions, um, you have two ways you can handle those. Um, you, can, uh, text to, uh, you can text the word DeBakey to 37607, or you can just uh, go into the live stream chat and text your questions there. We doc actually have Dr. Malcolm Irani. He's one of our third year gastro GI, GI fellows. He actually did three years with us as a resident, now three years as a fellow, and will join faculty uh, in a couple months as he graduates, which we're very excited. And so he will be there to answer your questions in the background. Before that, I'd like to welcome Rob Fondren. Rob, along with his cousin, Duncan Underwood, uh, co-chairs our council for the Underwood Center, which involves probably a number of you on this uh, uh, town hall today, as well as many others who provide support and direction for us. So a big shout out and thank you to each of you as well. So now I'll turn things over to Rob. Thank you. Good morning. I am Rob Fondren co-chair of the Linda K. and David M. Underwood Center for Digestive Disorders Council, also known as the GI Council. For those of our new friends joining us this morning, the GI Council is a small group of volunteers who work with the talented physicians in the Underwood Center and the Houston Methodist Foundation to raise the visibility and awareness of the exceptional programs within the center. We're excited to be part of today's town hall and we welcome you to today's program. Digestive disorders and your gut health are not topics that people really like to discuss. However, there are people suffering every day from the chronic conditions that greatly impact their lives, and these issues need to be addressed so they may live healthy and productive lives. Today, we will hear from Dr. Eamon Quigley, who is the director of the Linda K. and David M. Underwood Center for Digestive Disorders. Dr. Quigley will discuss the latest advances in combating digestive disorders, the Innovative Food and Health Alliance, and how your gut health impacts inflammation and other chronic conditions. We also will hear from Dr. Rachel Caesar, who will discuss the importance of colon cancer screenings. And finally, Dr. David Victor will discuss strategies to reduce your risk for a new Texas epidemic, fatty liver disease. Before we turn the program over to Dr. Quigley, I wanted to share a little bit about why I chose to be involved with Houston Methodist. For me personally, my family and I have been associated with Houston Methodist since the hospital's founding more than 100 years ago. My great grandmother's passion towards Houston Methodist is still a deep connection for our family. The commitment Linda and David Underwood made creating the Underwood Center is just one of the more recent investments our family has made in this incredible institution and the people who work here. We are greatly appreciated of the many other donors who have joined, who have joined our family in support of Houston Methodist Hospital and the Linda K. and David M. Underwood Center. And I'm incredibly proud to work so closely with the outstanding team of physicians and leadership at Houston Methodist to address our everyday health challenges, particularly in digestive disorders. We are truly in remarkable times where our work being done today is improving lives, not only in our community, but around the world. I'd like to give a big thank you to Houston Methodist leadership, physicians, and the scientists for all they have done and continue to do to lead medicine. With that, let's turn it over to Dr. Quigley. Dr. Quigley? Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm going to give you an update today, but I'm going to give you an update in the context of the Underwood Center. The Underwood Center was founded in 2013 through the very generous donation of Linda Kay and David M. Underwood. And 
every time I give a talk about Underwood, I always start with this slide because it encapsulates the ethos behind the center, which was given to us by David and Linda Underwood. It is dedicated to delivery of integrated care across specialties for digestive disorders. It is devoted to the education and training of healthcare practitioners, students, patients, and their families, and it is committed to clinical and translational research. Now, one thing I have to highlight here is that next year will be our 10-year anniversary, and we're already planning some very special events for you, so look out for that in 2023. Now, what is Underwood? Underwood actually is very inclusive. It actually includes anyone who deals with problems related to the gastrointestinal tract, all the way from the esophagus uh, down through the stomach and small intestine to the colon, and of course also includes the liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and bile ducts. So who is Underwood? Underwood includes anybody who deals in any way with any of those disorders. It could be a gastroenterologist, a GI surgeon, thoracic surgeon, bariatric surgeon, colon rectal surgeon. But also and very importantly includes uh, our colleagues in radiology and imaging, in pathology, GI oncology, radiation oncology, nutrition and psychology. And this is a very important aspect of Underwood and one that we very much inherited from uh, David and Linda Underwood namely the integrated care of patients across all of these specialties. I should also mention that Underwood is closely overlapped or closely overlaps with other centers. You will hear from David Victor who is also a part of the J.C. Walter Jr. Transplant Center because of course liver is part of what we do. Um, we also overlap with the Mary and Ron Neal Cancer Center because of course we deal with the diagnosis of gastrointestinal cancer as you'll hear from my colleague Rachel Schieser in just a few minutes. And we actually overlap with several others, as you will see when I talk about research later on. So what's the story so far? As um, we've already heard from Dr. Boom, we were recognized as a center of excellence. We are guided by a council of business and community leaders, co-chaired, and I should say, co-chaired in an outstanding fashion by Rob Fonda and Duncan Underwood. We are ranked number 10 by US News and World Report. <coughs> and we've actually been in the top 15 since our in inception and have always been number one in Texas. We're one of the leading uh, liver transplant programs in the US. And since the accreditation of our training program in 2014, we've graduated 10 fellows and have now expanded to three trainees per year and added, thanks to David Victor, an advanced training program in transplant hepatology, will, which will commence in just a few months. Who are we? This is a list of who we are at present, which includes gastroenterologists, hepatologists, as well as very supported by uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners. This is only the list in gastroenterology. It is an equivalent list, of course, for surgery. And I'm pleased to report that we have several new recruits who will be coming on board over the next few months uh, because we really are very busy and need all the help that we can get. Now, what I want to now focus on is what we do. And as I do this, I will highlight, and it will be in red, believe it or not, um, things that are especially um, prominent among new activities in, at, at uh, the Underwood Center. Gastroesophageal reflux, as you all know, is very common. I'm sure all of you have had heartburn at some time. Uh, one of the things we do offer here is the full range of diagnostics uh, for gastroesophageal reflux under the direction of Dr. Gulchin Ergen in the Reflux Center, which actually is one of the busiest reflux centers in the country. Our surgeons and endoscopists offer a number of alternatives for the treatment of reflux, uh, which do not involve open surgery, including the so-called Lynx technique and an endoscopic technique called a TIF. We're seeing more and more patients with problems of esophageal motility, such as achalasia. And again, we're very fortunate here to have the most advanced diagnostic tools, including high-resolution manometry, and a new technique which we found very helpful called endoflip. This Beautiful diagram shows you what Endoflip describes for us, and basically it measures the distensibility across the lower esophageal sphincter in real time and allows us to see if the sphincter is too tight or too loose. And indeed, the surgeons use it to calibrate uh, their um, surgeries for gastroesophageal reflux, but we use it really to pin down these difficult esophageal motility problems. We have a lot of tools for the early detection and staging of esophageal cancer as well. Moving on to the stomach, uh, one of the things we see most commonly in the hospital, and this was particularly common during the COVID epidemic, uh, was, the, uh, was bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract, and in particular from the stomach and the duodenum.
And I'm pleased to report that we have a full range of hemostatic techniques available. And I think it's fair to say, and I hope um, Dr. Schuster and Victor will agree with me, that it's rare that we're not able to control bleeding in these usually very acutely ill patients. Gastric cancer has not gone away, even though you might think so. And particularly here in Houston, given the demographics of our population, we see quite a lot of patients with gastric cancer or stages before gastric cancer, and we have tools for early detection and staging. I see a lot of patients with a common and very disabling disorder called gastroparesis, whereby the stomach does not empty its contents. And one of the problems here may be that the outlet from the stomach, which we refer to as the pylorus, is too contracted and does not allow food to get out. And one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Stonel Dacha, whom we re recruited from Emory, uh, performs this extraordinary technique whereby he goes down with the scope and literally burrows his way under the lining of the stomach, gets into the muscle layer, and divides the muscle fibers in this pylorus. And we, he's now been doing this actually in a prospective study um, and shown that it does help patients with gastroparesis. We were one of the few centers uh, who's doing this. Moving on to the small intestine of the colon, I'll just highlight a few different conditions here. Um, celiac disease is something I've had an interest in for a long time. And I'm pleased to report, and I see this as one of the questions that came in, that we're beginning to explore alternatives to a gluten-free diet. And I, just today, actually, I got notice that we have been enrolled in a national study looking at some alternatives to gluten-free diet in celiac disease. Inflammatory bowel disease. Um, which involves Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, has been a major focus here uh, through the generous support of the Fondren Foundation in the Fondren Inflammatory Bowel Disease uh, Program. This is led by Dr. Bincy Abraham, who has always doing studies on new therapies for patients with, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and actually has become a pioneer in the country in the use of ultrasound uh, to detect uh, activity and complications of inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, she is the first person in the US to use this as a clinical tool and is now being asked to train other people within the US uh, because it's clearly been recognized as very important. This may be difficult to see, but right in the middle of your picture here, you see a grossly dilated loop of uh, intestine, which then narrows down suddenly uh, to a stricture in a patient with Crohn's disease. And recently, Dr. Abram presented her results at one of the national meetings. And what you can see here is that um, in over here is that several of these patients had a change in therapy because of the findings in ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And of course, the advantage of ultrasound is that it's non-invasive, there's no radiation exposure, and it's actually done in the clinic. So the patient comes to see Dr. Abraham or one of her colleagues, and they immediately have their ultrasound, they have their disease evaluated, and then changes in therapy can be instituted. Moving on to the liver, I, Dr. Victor is the hepatologist here, so I won't step on his uh, toes, um, but I will mention a few things. During my lifetime, one of the most amazing advances in all of medicine, I think, is the, the ability to cure chronic hepatitis, which was the major cause of chronic liver disease and need for liver transplantation. Here at Methodist, there are several clinical trials ongoing in collaboration with MD Anderson Cancer Center and other collaborators in various aspects of liver cancer. In transplantation, as I mentioned, Houston Methodist is a national leader. They're now doing liver donor transplants, and we actually have become uh, exceptionally skilled at doing these multivisceral transplants, such as heart and liver, or lung and liver, or even kidney and liver. And as we'll hear later uh, from Dr. Victor, we're now dealing with this new epidemic, uh, as Rob Fronten mentioned, namely metabolic liver disease. We also are involved in pancreas and bile ducts, in pancreatic cancer, we have tools for accurate diagnosis, and our surgeons here are very proud of the fact that they have an extremely low surgical mortality for these major surgeries on the uh, pancreas, even though these tumors often occur in older and quite ill individuals. We have new and advanced imaging for looking at the bile duct, for bile duct stones and bile duct cancer, and have a variety of endoscopic techniques to address this. This is just one picture, this is actually looking within the bile duct up into the two divisions of the bile duct using um, a technique called spyglass. We do, do conferences and symposium. Our Friday morning interdisciplinary conference, which is chaired by my colleague, Dr. Alberto Barroso, is, I believe, the longest running conference here at Houston Methodist. Dr. Abram chairs monthly citywide IBD conferences. We have monthly citywide motility conferences in conjunction with MD Anderson and um, Memorial Hermann. We have an annual Underwood Symposia, 
and we've had now had nine annual Houston Methodist IBD lectures through the generous uh, support from uh, Dr. and Mrs. Carl Schmuller. And on the right, you will see a picture from our latest IBD lecture. I'm just going to give you a very quick snapshot of the research projects that are going on. We have clinical trials, as I mentioned, in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, Dr. Abram and Dr. Victor are looking at fatty liver in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And she's also looking at using curcumin in patients with inflammatory bowel disease who also have arthropathy. In conjunction with the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, we've got a major program looking at cardiovascular disease in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And I've already mentioned the collaborations with MD Anderson in hepatocellular carcinoma and glandiocarcinoma. Dr. Victor uh, with Dr. Rob Robbins is looking at novel imaging techniques for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And also, uh, they are part of a national study looking at transplantation for alcoholic liver disease. Working with my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues, I should say, back in Ireland, we're looking at the microbiome for new therapeutics in, in, with, in irritable bowel syndrome. And I, I've also worked with a startup company in Israel using this vibra vibrating capsule in, in chronic constipation. And we actually will have a plenary presentation on this at the upcoming Digestive Diseases Week. With the University of Houston, we collaborated on new approaches to anorectal function. I've already mentioned the study that Dr. Datch is doing in G poem. Uh, we have just finished completed a study on food allergy and irritable bowel syndrome. And very important for our program, in fact, from the institution, are the projects we do with our fellows and residents. Uh, this photograph uh, means a lot to me because this was the first time we went live to any conference for about three years. And in fact, Malcolm Morani, who is taking the questions, is uh, pictured down on the bottom. But this are four of the posters, of actually four, I think, something like 14 posters we had at the American College meeting. And this also illustrates another very important issue, namely the tremendous help we get from pathology and imaging, without whom we would not have these wonderful portrayal, portrayal, portraits of uh, gastrointestinal pathology and gastrointestinal imaging. We heard about the Inflammation Collaborative. This actually includes the uh, Food and Health um, program as well. And this is a joint program with the uh, immunology program here to look at the fundamental role that inflammation plays in so many disorders. This is a multi-stage program which involves uh, looking at gastrointestinal inflammation, but moving on ultimately to look at inflammation which may originate in the gut, may actually translate into problems in the central nervous system, in the heart, etc. And we've just we're into the second year of this uh, collaborative, which is so generously f supported by the Fondren Foundation. So what for the future? Uh, we certainly want to develop and provide leading medicine care across the spectrum of digestive disorders. We want to educate the physicians of the future. We want to actively engage with patients in the community to further digestive he health. And of course, we want to be at the cutting edge of clinical and translational research. And I'm very pleased to report that with some recent recruits, uh, we are well on our way to really moving into translation research and bringing the fruits of that laboratory research to the bedside, to the patient, which of course is ultimately what's most important for us all. And with that, I will conclude my section and I will uh, introduce Dr. Rachel Schieser, who is one of my colleagues, a gastroenterologist, uh, who's got a special interest in colon cancer screening, and she will give us an update on, on screening for colorectal cancer which I think is a very important topic because there are actually quite a few new changes, Rachel, in this area, which she's going to update us on. So, Rachel, over to you. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Quigley. And thank you very much, Dr. Boom, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be able to discuss these topics. And I feel very fortunate to be a part of the Underwood Center. The multidisciplinary collaboration in the Underwood Center is unparalleled and enables us to provide very complicated care um, in a, a outstanding fashion. So I'm very happy to be here. And I'm excited to talk with you all about updates and screening for colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is cancer that arises from the colon, which is the large intestine, as noted in this figure in the green. We specifically say rectal cancer when we're referring to cancer that arises in the last part of the colon, which is the rectum, because it does have some differences in treatments but it's all <clears throat> grouped together as colorectal cancer. So I always like to start with the good news. The good news is that most colorectal cancer is preventable. And the reason that is, is it almost always starts as a polyp, which is a benign little growth in the superficial lining of the colon. 
and it can grow very slowly over time. So if you see in this picture, it starts as a little bump and it can expand and become a larger polyp and then a bigger polyp and then um, eventually can transform into cancer. Now, <clears throat> when we do colonoscopy, we find these very commonly. Polyps are found in about half of people who undergo screening colonoscopy. And not all of them are destined to turn into cancer. Maybe about 10% could eventually, with enough time, um, transform into cancer. So the really great thing about um, colonoscopy is that we can go in there and remove these precancerous polyps before they have a chance to become very large and cause problems and turn into cancer. So we're all about prevention. Some more good news is that our screening programs have been working. Overall, the rates of colon cancer and colon death have been decreasing over time, largely because we're finding cancers earlier and finding large polyps earlier and removing them. Also good news is the five-year relative survival has been increasing over time. When you find the cancers earlier with screening programs, they have better prognosis, they're easier to deal with. I also have to give um, some uh, attention to my surgical and oncology colleagues here for the excellent work that they're doing and also improving cancer treatment. So the not so good trend is that um, the incidence of colon and rectal cancer seems to be increasing amongst younger people. So this is a chart of people under 50. These are people who don't yet qualify for colon cancer screening. And it seems to be going up with time. So this is a, a concerning trend that we have noticed. I like this slide because what we're looking at here is the incidence of colon cancer in a population by age. And you see from age 49 to 50, there is a bump up. And it's not that at 50, the colon all of a sudden starts producing a bunch of cancer. It's that at 50, people are finally able to be checked out. So under age 50, we're finding these cancers because they're presenting with symptoms and signs, typically bleeding or anemia, things like that. Um, but once people reach the age of 50, they're eligible for screening. And so we're finding these cancers now that have already been existing in the colon. Um, the, the issue that we're seeing though is that some of these cancers have already advanced past the earliest stages and we don't really want to find them then. It would be much better to find them at the earliest stage or even an advanced polyp so that could be removed. So how do we capture these people who have had this cancer but are not able to get screening yet? They could benefit from screening earlier. So many cancer societies have looked into this and fortunately the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force updated their guidelines as of May 2021 so that screening can now be offered for people starting age 45. So how do we do screening? There are several options. There are stool-based tests, there's imaging tests, the CT colonography, and there are endoscopic procedures. So for the stool-based test, these are recommended for people who are average risk for colorectal cancer. If people are known to be higher risk, they are kind of steered away from the stool-based test towards colonoscopy because of the better detection. But for average risk, stool-based tests are recommended. The earliest would be the guaiac-based fecal occult blood test, which is recommended to be done on an annual basis, so every year. It is sensitive to detect cancer about 50 to 75 percent, but it doesn't really detect la the large precancerous polyps, what we call advanced adenomas, very well. The fecal immunohistochemical test, or FIT, is also done on an annual basis. Its sensitivity to detect cancer is about 74 percent, and it is a little more sensitive than the FOBTs to detect advanced um, polyps. The only DNA test that we have available in the United States now is the Cologuard, which is a combination of DNA and the FIT test. It's recommended to be done every three years when used for screening. It has a good sensitivity to detect cancer at 93%, and it's the best stool-based test to detect advanced um, adenomas, or those large precancerous polyps, but it's still only 43%, so we're missing over half of the, the large polyps with that. Um, and then, of course, if your stool test is positive, then you're going to need to have the colonoscopy to actually go in there and look and see why it might be positive. 
The other thing to think about is with any of these tests, you can have false positives. So you get a positive test, but there's not actually something going on in the colon. And the different tests have different rates of false positivity. So uh, the imaging test that's recommended is the CT colonography, which can be done every five years. It does do a great job at detecting colon cancer and is sensitive for larger precancerous polyps as well as polyps over six millimeters. But it may miss flat polyps. It does require the full bowel prep and there is some radiation exposure with CT. So if you start early and you have multiple sequential scans, there is some concern about the cumulative radiation exposure. The other thing that can happen is you can find things on the CAT scan outside of the colon, which in some instances may be helpful, but in a lot of other instances may just increase the, the worry burden on patients and have um, unnecessary evaluations. And then if the colonography is positive and they find something, you'll still need the colonoscopy to go in there and remove those polyps, which if it can't be done at the same day, requires another bowel prep uh, another day. So then we come to the endoscopic procedures. Um, one recommendation would be to do a sigmoidoscopy, which is um, an invasive procedure where we take the camera and we look at the rectum and up into the sigmoid colon. It does not examine the rest of the colon. Um, it requires a modified prep. Most people don't have to drink the whole laxative for it, but can do some enemas beforehand. It can be done without sedation, although many people in the past have found this to be very uncomfortable. And it has a low race, rate of serious adverse events when compared with colonoscopy. If polyps are found in that part of the colon, they can be removed at the time of the exam, but then it'll be recommended that the patient come back after a full bowel prep to do the full colonoscopy and see if there are more polyps in other areas of the colon. The colonoscopy is the gold standard, and in a normal average risk patient, if it is um, normal and there's no polyps found, it can be done every 10 years. It is very good at detecting colon cancer and sensitive for detecting those large precancerous polyps as well as polyps that are smaller. During colonoscopy, we can even find very tiny polyps and remove them. It does, of course, require the full prep, um, and most people prefer to be sedated for the colonoscopy. Um, also, during the, the procedure itself, all the polyps you can usually be removed. But because it is an invasive procedure, there are some significant risks. The risks of a tear to the colon is very small. It's about three per 10,000 procedures and bleeding be 14.6 per 10,000 procedures. The bleeding that happens in the context of colonoscopy is usually when removing a large precancerous polyp. So a lot of people say, well, I had my colonoscopy, now when do I need to do this again? Well, there are new guidelines that came out in 2020 from the major GI societies that gave us this algorithm of how to figure out uh, when to bring people back and update that. <clears throat> and the most important thing for a lot of people would be this one here where I put the arrow looking at very small polyps, one to two tubular adenomas that are less than 10 millimeters. We used to recommend people come back in five years. However, the GI societies came back and said, if this is a really good colonoscopy and you're confident you've removed the polyp, you can actually let the patient come back in a longer time frame, seven to, to 10 years, which is good. So we may be starting colonoscopy earlier, but hopefully we'll be doing them less frequently uh, with the new guidelines. So how do you decide which one to do? And kind of look at three things. Is the patient high risk for colorectal cancer or not? And I look at the individual's risk of harm from doing an invasive procedure and what the patient's goals are of the screening process. So are they average risk or do they have risk factors? If they have risk factors, then we might actually start earlier than 45 and we might do colonoscopies more frequently. Some risk factors include a personal history of precancerous polyps or a history of colon cancer in either themselves or their family members, um, any known or suspected hereditary syndromes, history of inflammatory bowel disease, history of abdominal or pelvic radiation, and cystic fibrosis. Then looking at the harm from colonoscopy, 
I look at the patient's age because as age increases, some of the complication rates can be uh, increased as well, and medical conditions that might lead to complications during the procedure, issues that would make it more dangerous to undergo sedation, people who are on blood thinners or have bleeding disorders, issues with anesthesia or difficulty um, safely performing the bowel prep itself. And then I take into account patients that might have unusual anatomy or have had a very difficult colonoscopy previously into that equation as well. And then people should know what exactly they're looking for with their test. Are we just trying to find if you get colon cancer at a very early stage? Are we trying to find larger polyps? Do we want to do a test that's more sensitive for that? Or are we going for full on prevention of larger polyps and colon cancer? So as a gastroenterologist, what I like to see is the polyp like this, something that's small. I look at this and I say, okay, this is probably a precancerous polyp, but it's gonna be very easy for me to remove. And when I remove it, it's not going to have a high risk of bleeding or other issues. I'm just gonna be able to get it right out of there and then it can't grow and it can't turn into cancer one day. It's very gratifying. What I'm not as excited to see is a very large polyp like this one. This is gonna be a more complicated removal, has a higher incidence of bleeding afterwards, um, and I would rather it didn't even get to that stage. So, in summary, colorectal cancer screening saves lives. It's focusing on early detection and prevention. It's now offered at age 45. There are multiple good options for screening and should be individualized for each patient. And, um, now, hopefully, we can bring people back in less time if they have one or two very small polyps. So, thank you. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. David Victor. Um, Dr. Victor is an associate professor for clinical medicine with Will Cornell here at Houston Methodist. He received his medical degree from the University of Kentucky and did his internal medicine and gastroenterology training at Tulane in New Orleans. He completed his transplant hepatology training at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're very fortunate now to have him as our director of the Metabolic Liver Disease Program in the Sherry and Allen Conover Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation. Thank you very much, Rachel. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to learn that I get to have my first colonoscopy earlier. <laughs> So <clears throat> I always have a request to do the fatty liver talk right before lunch, so I hope everyone appreciates the information we're going to talk about today in the new epi epidemic that is uh, occurring in our current uh, society. So first, we need to really define what is fatty liver. Fatty liver is very common, and it's gotten so common that we have had to actually change the diagnosis. We now uh, have a condition called MAFLD. It was previously NAFLD, but now we feel that MAFLD, or metabolic associated fatty liver disease, is a better terminology. This is any condition that can cause fatty liver disease. It is estimated that 50% of the globe meets criteria for MAFLD in our current uh, world. However, our previous definition, which I think people are more uh, understanding of and we will deal with a little bit more today, is NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That is fat in the, liver, uh, in the liver by imaging or histology, which is biopsy, without any other causes for fat accumulation. You can't have significant uh, alcohol consumption, and there are no other causes for fatty liver, whether that's genetic, metabolic, and there are no other causes of liver disease. So it's simply fat in the liver. Why is this so important is that fatty liver is uh, falling in line with our uh, obesity epidemic. This is a slide that shows that in 1991, only four states had greater than 15% of their population that were considered obese. In 2010, none of the states had less than 20% of their population being considered obese. This gets worse. While Texas no longer is the highest color here, they have changed the scale so that uh, the red is greater than 35% of the population for the entire state is obese. Texas uh, is one of our, uh, has a, a problem with obesity as well. And as you can see, there are distinct areas of Texas, those uh, in uh, East Texas, closer to Arkansas and Louisiana, that have rates in the f nearly 40%. 
with uh, some uh, short, uh, lower rates in the middle of Texas, but in Houston we are moderate at around 35 to 40 percent. So this means that most everyone I see in my clinic has some risk factor or uh, opportunity to have fatty liver disease. This is even more concerning uh, amongst our patients of Hispanic descent. This shows that Texas uh, is one of the leading states for obesity amongst our Hispanic population. This is especially concerning given some data from down in Brownsville that showed that the uh, Hispanic community carries the highest risk of liver-related cancer that we think has uh, problems due to their uh, high rates of fatty liver and obesity. The highest rate of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma quoted in Texas is something like uh, 10 times higher than the national rate in this Brownsville population. So we think that the precursor for this is their fatty liver and diabetes. So we are actively working to identify patients. So why is this so important? Well, if one in two people have fatty liver disease or MAFLD, that means that most people have a risk factor to, to progress towards cirrhosis. We think that only 5% of all people who end up with a diagnosis of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease will develop cirrhosis. But this makes it for a very challenging uh, diagnostic problem. The symptoms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease only begin with cirrhosis. So as you look at this chart, and I'm going to try to use the pointer here to see if I can Nothing other than the end stage causes symptoms, while patients with NASH and fibrosis or fatty liver can continue to progress along the uh, spectrum of disease towards cirrhosis without ever knowing. This makes for quite a challenge, but that is what we're working toward uh, in our metabolic liver disease uh, clinics. So how do we diagnose fatty liver? Well, gold standard for fatty liver is liver biopsy. This is greater than 5% of the liver is replaced by fat. That would be considered non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. However, not many patients uh, are diagnosed by biopsy. Typically, our patients are diagnosed via imaging. Ultrasound being the most common, that shows if you have greater than 30% of the liver with steatosis, that it is 100% uh, sensitive to uh, diagnose fatty liver. CT scan is also uh, reasonable uh, with uh, lesser rates than uh, ultrasound, but still uh, adequate uh, to diagnose uh, moderate to severe fatty liver. We uh, collaborate with uh, Dr. Karam Nasser in our preventive cardiology program uh, to begin a program where patients undergoing cardiac CT are being, uh, our radiologists are being asked to look at the liver specifically and compare uh, the fat uh, content in the liver to the spleen. And we are identifying multiple patients on incidental findings uh, with CT scan of fatty liver. MRI is also the most probably uh, therapeutic tool we have that can detect lower levels of fatty liver and we use a special technique called the PDFF, or the protein density fat fraction, that can be followed longitudinally to see if someone is gaining more fat or losing fat over time with their disease. So most patients typically will be diagnosed with ultrasound. So what do we recommend? Well, for all patients who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the mainstay of our recommendations are lifestyle-based. We recommend caloric restriction of 700 to 1,000 uh, calories per day. We encourage weight loss. We know that a two, three to 5% uh, body weight loss over time that's maintained can improve fat in the liver, but it requires greater than 10% to improve uh, advanced, more advanced fatty liver with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fibrosis. We encourage uh, exercise. Um, a study from Texas A&M uh, showed that e both cardiovascular as well as strength-based uh, exercise done greater than three times a week can improve your non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we discourage heavy alcohol consumption. 
So these are basic recommendations that most doctors make to their patients, but we're a little more emphatic in the fatty liver clinic on the need for these. The reason is this. The most effective therapy for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at this point is weight loss. If you see that you can improve your steatosis with a weight loss greater than or equal to 3% of the body weight in 50, 35 to 100% of patients, whereas a weight loss of uh, 5 to 7% is, in, is required to improve the predisposition to developing advanced fibrosis. And you must lose at least 10% of your body weight to improve your fibrosis in nearly 50% of patients. While these all sound like reasonable numbers, when we do the real world trials, there is only less than 10% of our patients are able to achieve these goals of 10% in a year. And while 30% of our patients are able to achieve the moderate goals of about 3 to 5% in one year. This is not a very high percentage, and in our metabolic center, we are looking to how to improve these rates uh, of success. So if you have fatty liver, can, should you just lose weight, or is there more you can do? Uh, through the Metabolic Liver Disease Clinic, we have made a specific uh, play, uh, 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 ask of our primary care group and our other providers to try to identify the highest risk patients in our community. What we have done is created an algorithm for our uh, providers to follow to identify patients using a simple math equation that uh, uses the platelets, age, liver functions called the AST and ALT to create a score called the FIB4 score. A FIB4 score less than 1.3 has a 97% negative predictive value, meaning that if you have it less than 1.3, it is unlikely you have advanced liver disease from fatty liver. Those patients can continue to follow with their primary care doctor and have their fingers uh, or their uh, try to lose weight on their own, Whereas those with a greater than 1.3% uh, 1.3 on their FIB4 test do not necessarily have advanced liver disease, but there's a 50% chance that they do. So in doing that, we've encouraged them to uh, refer patients to our Metabolic Liver Disease Center, where more involved testing can determine if they have advanced liver disease. I want to highlight one program we have here at Methodist that uh, sits in between our uh, metabolic liver disease clinic and uh, uh, Dr. Abraham's IBD clinic. We, um, Dr. Abraham has created an uh, interesting uh, paper with uh, her colleague Dr. Carrie Glasner, who's a faculty member here as well, that showed that there's an increased risk of fatty liver disease in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Those patients are likely to be older, have longer standing IBD, and more likely to have had steroids. So she has also worked using her in-office ultrasound uh, with Dr. Glasner to identify patients with NAFLD uh, incidentally amongst their uh, screening uh, IBD ultrasounds. In doing so, we've created a specific group of people that see both the Fondren IBD Center and the Metabolic Liver Disease Program to try to reverse their NAFLD through diet and pharmacotherapies. This will probably be a continuing problem in the IBD world in that as we increase the mucosal healing through better medicines, we will see increases in weight in our patients more frequently. So this is a summary. I made this slide so it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but I hope this helps to talk about current strategies and treatments for NAFLD and NASH. Once you've had your steatosis identified, as you can tell, the didn't quite work out like I hoped, but that's okay. Everyone should be encouraged to lose weight. We should assess patients for advanced disease or fibrosis. And if patients do have advanced fibrosis or evidence of significant fibrosis, they should be directed toward a provider who can help them with uh, pharmacotherapy that we have. There is currently no FDA approved medicine for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we are using medicines that have been studied uh, in the condition, but have been approved for other indications. Vitamin E is a background for patients who are non-serotic that may have some benefit uh, if you have fibrosis. 
pioglitazone or actose also has shown some benefit but does cause weight gain which is uh, contra uh, intuitive when you're looking for a condition where weight loss is the mainstay. For those who don't have fibrosis, we should consider following them longitudinally. Just being told you're okay does not mean your fatty liver disease cannot progress toward more advanced disease. We are looking at FDA approved anti-obesity pharmacotherapy in a certain population of people. This is actively being studied uh, for in some pharmaceutical uh, sponsored clinical trials here at Houston Methodist. And we do not shy away from involving our bariatric surgery uh, colleagues and our weight loss programs there. I work with Dr. Uh, Sherman to try to better care for our bariatric patients post-surgery. And I have a close relationship with our weight loss center on all fronts because it is important that we are all working together toward the same goal. And in patients who have metabolic syndrome or increased cardiovascular risk, diabetes, we are using metformin as it may decrease the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in certain patients. We do recommend uh, cholesterol medicines with uh, statin-based therapy in most patients who have cardiovascular risk despite having liver disease. I get a lot of calls from patients who said the pharmacist said I shouldn't take this uh, because it might hurt my liver. We actually do recommend statins in these patients. Uh, we are using uh, GLP-1 agonists for our patients with diabetes and obesity uh, to try to improve this. We also discourage alcohol. Alcohol and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can be a one-two punch to accelerate the progression of liver disease toward more advanced fibrosis. So what is the future for MAFLD? Well, Diet and exercise are not going away, I hate to say it. We hope to better categorize our patients. As this cartoon in the bottom shows, not everyone has only that they're eating too much or that they're diabetic. There are patients who have genetic predispositions that we are better trying to identify. We are trying to create a more individualized uh, path forward for patients so that we're not just saying diet. And we are looking to target the marker biome in the future, which I think Dr. Quigley is going to help us move forward with. I do believe there will be medicines uh, coming forward with antifibrotic and antisteatotic therapies, but currently there is no approved medicines. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Those are uh, three fascinating presentations. So thank you to all three uh, colleagues here. I, I say this every time and I mean it every time as a primary care physician. Uh, I always learn so much uh, in these sessions and it actually helps me be a better physician as well as understand so well what's happening in, in such great manner across our institution. Um, so a lot of you have sent some great questions, which I'm going to farm out, but I'm going to pick up on a couple things that I just want to tease out from your questions first. Um, Dr. Quigley, you said something that just sort of caught my ear and I just wanted to ask about it because I think some people might be interested. You said something about having seen many more people with bleeding, and I think you were particularly mentioning gastric bleeding, mm -hmm. um, in, during COVID. Yes. Tell me a little bit more about that. I think people might be curious to hear why that is. Well, I think there, there are probably at least two factors in, in these patients. Of course, this is occurring primarily in the patients who are extremely ill, who are in the intensive care unit. So as, as we all know, patients who are in the intensive care unit, who are ventilated, who are very stressed, will get ulcers and will bleed anyway. Yeah. The second complication, of course, in the patients with COVID is because of the fact that they're so prone to developing thrombosis, they were all on anticoagulants correctly. So if you put the two together, you've got ulcers, you've got on anticoagulants, yeah. then you've got a very high risk of bleeding. And that's something we've actually looked at. One of the things we actually lo have looked at recently is looking at nutritional support for these patients. And some of these patients, unfortunately, need uh, help with nutrition in the form of a percutaneous gastrostomy. And we actually show that they're quite safe in these COVID patients as long as you follow various protocols, even though they do have a high risk, or high risk of bleeding. So I think they're probably the two factors, stress from everything that's going on, plus the fact they're on anticoagulants. Perfect, thank you. Well, and then Dr. Caesar, I wanna ask one question about kind of staying healthy. That was the whole point of yours, obviously, was avoiding uh, cancer. I wanna ask kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So the recommendations are 45 now. Um, is 
are all the payers paying for that yet? So if one is a patient, can you feel confident that when you're 45, you can get that yet? Or is there some lag time in that with the payers? Sure. Actually, we've been very fortunate and within the past year, it seems like most of the payers are covering screening starting at age 45. That certainly was not the case previous to that. So we haven't had that much issue. One of the things we also do in our clinic, of course, is before going to the colonoscopy, we verify and make sure that the patients know how much they would be responsible for for their procedure. Good. And I'd say, I mean, I would characterize as a primary care physician, probably the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force, gold standard, but also tends to be the most conservative. The societies tend to move faster than it. So this once it moves, the payment usually happens. So we'll exactly. get. So other question, on the other end, because mm -hmm. I know we have some people on here who are thinking about that age-wise, when do you stop? Sure. And how, what are the recommendations? And then how do you individualize those recommendations? Mm -hmm. So it depends on which guideline you're looking at. Typically somewhere between 75 and 80, we consider stopping screening. It kind of does depend also what the patient's individual risk is mm -hmm. of getting colon cancer and of undergoing the procedures and the screening. Um, but usually somewhere between there and at 85, we really try to discourage people from proceeding sure. because the risks and the benefits don't quite add up the same. Perfect. So, and, and again, I'm referring mostly, of course, to a average risk person. They haven't had uh, any problems on their previous colonoscopies. Sure. Um, so somewhere kind of in that window, 75 obviously, to 80. depending on the rest of what's going on. Exactly. In that patient. Okay, great. All right. Well, so speaking of kind of staying well, then a couple of questions that came through. So I'll start with Dr. Victor. Um, because uh, I think you caught everybody's attention today. Everybody uh, thinks about colon cancer screening. Not everybody's been thinking about uh, fatty liver screening. So a couple questions here. I'll start with, you know, how do we detect this? And is this something when I go in as an annual physical, is it being thought about and are there screenings that are happening? So the easy answer is yes, but no. <laughs> um, uh, so on an annual screening, typically liver function tests will be elevated. The most concerning part for fatty liver is not the presence of steatosis or fat in the liver. It's inflammation caused by that fat. So if we use uh, the current standards from the GI society, as Dr. Boom intonated, we move a little faster than the USPFTF, that a woman who has an ALT greater than 19 should be considered elevated. And a man with an ALT greater than 30 should be considered elevated. If you use those numbers and you have elevation, then I would ask the primary care doctor to consider doing an ultrasound to identify uh, fatty liver. From that uh, testing algorithm, you can then begin to work through more and more uh, ways to stratify. A FIB4 score, which we talked about in the context of fatty liver, can be used in any patient to identify patients who have at risk for fatty or for at risk for hepatic fibrosis from any cause. But in the context of fatty liver, if you have elevated liver enzymes and you're overweight, which that keeps dropping, so uh, more and more of us qualify for being overweight, you should consider fatty liver. So it, it begins at your annual physical, but may have to continue beyond that. So, so the FIB4 score, and you talked about this with our primary care physicians, is that something that's happening routinely if one wants to kind of take matters into their own hand? I mean, it's so pretty simple to do it's, on, it's on, it's online with a calculator. Very, very right? simple. Uh, MD calculator has it. We created a, a, a dot phrase in the EPIC for all of our providers. That's dot FIB4 scores with an S. Uh, to give you the interpretation in that, but it's only, it's from the annual laboratory. So your platelets, your age, your AST, and your ALT, and you can calculate it on your own. But I encourage patients, even if you are positive, your FIB4 is elevated, it is not a great test for positivity. It's a better test for negativity. So if it is positive, please don't rush out and uh, worry that requires further testing, but it is not uh, a really good test if it's high. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say as a primary care physician, there's a couple things that oftentimes I use as a wake-up call and um, fatty liver early indications. That's one of them, obviously calcium scores and some other things that you can really get people's attention that you've been many times for many years trying to get their attention on some of these issues. Um, but it still obviously can be a, a very challenging 
qu issue to, to address. Um, obviously, weight loss is not an easy thing to do for almost anybody. Uh, okay, so let's talk about a couple other uh, shift of gears here. So uh, let's talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Are probiotics beneficial to prevent inflammatory bowel disease? It's a, a very good question. Uh, it's a very good question because we've known for many years that in some way or other, the interaction between the microbes in your gut and your immune system is at the heart of inflammatory bowel disease. The problem is we don't know exactly what the issues are. Is it that the microbiome is wrong? Is it the immune system is wrong? Or more likely, is it a combination of both? So based on that, you would expect that by modifying the microbiome that you could prevent inflammatory bowel disease. And that may be theoretically possible. You could possibly do it through diet, and there's actually increased interest now in, in diet and so-called inflammatory diets and their role in inflammatory bowel disease. The problem is that at the end of the day, there's a significant genetic factor in inflammatory bowel disease, which of course you can't do much about. So at the moment, I would say that while we believe that the microbiome is essential in the causation of inflammatory bowel disease, we do not have strategies either through diet or giving prebiotics or probiotics that have been shown to prevent inflammatory bowel disease. I wish that was the case, but as yet we're not there. And is inflammatory bowel disease sort of stable in incidence? Is it going up, going down? Where, where does it it's very, very, there's very It's a very interesting question. If you look across the world, inflammatory bowel disease is skyrocketing. In developed countries like the US, Canada, and Western Europe, the rate of Crohn's disease continues to go up, but that of ulcerative colitis has kind of plateaued, which is very interesting. And what's even more interesting to me is if you take a country which has recently become industrialized or become westernized, what you find is that before any westernization occurred, they probably had no inflammatory bowel disease or very little. Then as they undergo development, first you see ulcerative colitis and then later you begin to see Crohn's disease. So while as I mentioned, there are many genetic factors associated with the development of colitis and Crohn's disease. Clearly, there's a major environmental factor, which I think we're still tra trying to sort out. Great. Well, so you talk about environmental factors. We actually have a question sort of of a, another type of factor that can create problems. So let's switch to that question that came in around colorectal cancer and talking about hereditary components. And obviously, that changes some of the screening recommendations as well. Sure. It's a little bit of a, the same answer as Dr. Quigley. There are certainly genetic risk factors, and there are some very well-documented genetic or hereditary cancer syndromes, such as HNPCC or Lynch syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP. And those are very well documented. But there's also other genetic risk factors, which is why we take a detailed family history and we'll start earlier, do more intense screening for people with family history. There's also an environmental component that probably has a lot to do with diet. Um, because I know people who travel from one area to another, their risk of colon polyps and colon cancer can increase or decrease depending on where they're going to. Um, such as coming into the United States and eating the typical American diet can increase the risk. So it's both of those things. So we talk about now 45 years old is the routine. Mm -hmm. Talk about, you know, if you're younger than 45, what would be the clues that you should be screened earlier in mm -hmm. family history or otherwise? Because um, sometimes you may be coming to your doctor. Oftentimes people that age don't go to the doctor very often and don't even have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it really starts with primary care, taking a good family history, identifying people say, hey, you know, you have some several first degree family members who had polyps at a young age, colon cancer, especially under age 65, and a first degree relative would be one of those risk factors that we'd be like, okay, you know, maybe we need to do some genetic testing or we need to start your screening earlier. Typically, we'll start colonoscopy 10 years earlier than a first degree relative had been diagnosed with colon cancer. So if you had a, a really older first degree relative, let's say 75 or 80, that doesn't really change things too right. much. It's yeah, really when you have somebody kind of 65 and younger. Exactly. The older the first degree relative, the less likely it's related to something hereditary and the more likely it's something environmental. Great. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's talk about celiac disease. What, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, not uncommon at all. Um, and uh, you had mentioned a little bit some other approaches to just dietary change. So let's talk about uh, what are some of the new advancements. Sure. Actually, celiac disease is very common. It's about 1% of the population has uh, will have celiac disease. And one of the things that's happened during my lifetime as a physician is that the way celiac disease presents has changed dramatically. And we don't know why. 
when I was a medical student, we saw these emaciated children with severe malabsorption um, who were extremely emaciated and they had celiac disease. Now we pick it up mostly incidentally. Somebody who's maybe a little bit anemic, their folic acid level is low. There are various other things that, that can lead to us detection, but it's unusual that we see these emaciated people that we used to see before. So there's a much greater awareness of the importance of celiac disease in adults, regardless of age. It can be de detected at any age, even though you've probably had it for life. Uh, and of course, the big issue for the patient with celiac disease is that they're condemned to follow a gluten-free diet religiously for the rest of their life. So there are lots of uh, studies going on at the moment looking at, are there alternatives to this? Could we, for example, give people a drug which would um, change gluten in some way that it was, did not evoke the immune response which leads to celiac disease? And I'm pleased to report that we hope to start a study on this here at Houston Methodist within the next few months, um, looking at one of these alternatives. So the answer is, the good news is, as I'm taking up uh, Rachel's approach, the good news is that there's a, a lot of interest right now in the pharmaceutical industry and in basic science looking at novel approaches to celiac disease, which might involve maybe being able to ease off a little bit in the gluten-free diet and take a medication, or maybe even not to take a gluten-free diet at all. But it's too early to say that we're there. But look, what I can say is, look, there is research going on. It strikes me that today it's a lot easier to be gluten-free than it was once upon a time. Um, some people have, you know, obviously severe celiac and others. Talk a little bit about kind of the whole gluten-free topic that's out there, um, et cetera. Sure. Uh, gluten-free has become an incredible fad. Um, most people who are, on a gluten, who are taking a gluten-free diet don't have celiac disease, as you know. And there is an entity which is still poorly diagnosed, or poorly understood, but is being ev evaluated, and that is so-called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Those people who don't have celiac disease but can't eat wheat or the other uh, cereals uh, which contain a lot of gluten. Now that's actually become a little bit more complicated because it's become clear that it may not be the gluten, it may be other things in wheat that may be causing the sensitivity. So I think it's probably better to refer to it as non-celiac wheat sensitivity. Um, all I can say is that this is a, a growing area of interest. Some factors have already been identified which may predispose to this intolerance, and diets have been, can be instituted which can help with this. But for most people on a gluten-free diet, they're doing it for weight loss mm -hmm. or for lifestyle factors. And is there any harm for a person who goes gluten-free? There, there, well, there are potentially, there are a number of potential harms. Like it, it, the gluten-free diet restricts a lot of things, mm -hmm. which may provide various nutrients and, and vitamins, et cetera, in your diet, so you've got to watch for that. I think doing extreme diets in any, in any case may have some psychological uh, impacts which may lead to food restriction and food restricting behavior. I think that's something to be careful of. But the other thing, of course, is that, um, you know, w w you're absolutely correct. All the restaurants now say they're off offered gluten-free. But actually, if you're a celiac, you still have to check yeah. because they may be preparing the gluten-containing yeah. food and the gluten-free food on the same uh, countertop. Right and you get mixing of, of uh, products. So yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, if you're true celiac, you, I mean, you can't use really the same utensils. I mean, you can, no. you can react to very, very small quantities. Exactly, and, and the longer you, and I, I think it's probably true that the longer you've been on a strict gluten-free diet, the more sensitive you are to those occasional exposures, Great. which can really be very disrupting for that's people. That's helpful, because a lot of people obviously talk about that and think about that. So, um, all right, so, you know, I, I think one of the things that over time, certainly in my career, we've learned that you know there's good fats and bad fats more and more, right? Um, and in the realm of heart disease, we talk about that a lot. Um, we have a great question here about, okay, what about, are there good fats and bad fats when you think about fatty liver disease, or is this all really just an issue of weight and uh, lack of exercise and metabolic syndrome? So we, we have a very 10,000 foot view of fatty liver at this point. Uh, if you think of it in that we don't know enough on telling you uh, exactly how much good fat or how much bad fat there is. But uh, we use the literature from the cardiovascular colleagues since the leading cause of death for somebody with fatty liver is cardiovascular disease. We typically try to avoid the bad fats. We try to encourage weight loss overall because the body is better at taking care of inflammation at lower levels, which is why people who lose weight can improve their diabetic control, can decrease their cholesterol. So I don't encourage uh, people to eat lots of fat and or overemphasize one. 
I simply, uh, as Dr. Quigley said, we try to encourage better fats, which are, you know, avocado or uh, plant-based fats rather than uh, uh, animal-based uh, uh, fats or when we encourage lean meats if you're going to eat them. But overall, I think the jury is out on what is the best diet for fatty liver disease, but no one can argue that weight loss is uh, the key component to all of them. So in the metabolic center, we try to individualize diet to the person, whether they want to be uh, lower carb, whether they want to be plant-based, whether they want to be um, uh, involved in just caloric restriction. We do not encourage complete ketosis, though. Uh, that can actually exacerbate fatty liver if you get your uh, uh, carbs below 30 for an extended period of time because the body has to uh, mobilize lipids, which can actually make the fatty liver worse. So there are a couple of diets we don't recommend, but anybody who is interested in looking at good fats or bad fats is actively involved in their diet, and I think those, that's the first step mm -hmm. to identifying what is the best diet for you. So you said something really important, which is the most common cause of death is heart disease, because of course heart disease is still the number one cause of death, and the things that lead to fatty liver lead to heart disease at the same time. So putting that aside though, for the people who do progress as you showed along the scale, what are the, I mean, describe a little bit what it is that you're trying to avoid and how severe it can become and what it's like to be somebody with that kind of liver disease. So uh, everybody who uh, has heard about the liver from their health class uh, from middle school on says the liver can regenerate and that is true until it reaches cirrhosis. cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is permanent scar tissue due to inflammation. This does not have to be from alcohol or viral hepatitis. It can simply be from fatty liver over time. So once you reach cirrhosis, there's no cure for cirrhosis. We can improve the inflammation and stop the progression of disease, but it's not curative. The, ri the fastest rising indication for fatty liver, or for transplantation is fatty liver disease, whether that's from alcohol or from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we are now seeing that there's an increasing number of patients who have no significant alcohol history, who are a little older, who are coming for us for transplant. So those patients all, if they had identified their uh, risk factors earlier, would have had a chance through lifestyle modifications to prevent them from getting that transplant. So we really hope, I, honestly, I love that Methodist is one of the leading uh, transplant centers in the world and that we are going on pace to do more transplants than we've ever done. But I hope in my career that they, we don't do as many because we have better intervention in this disease state earlier. Well, and, that, and that's an important point because I mean, if, if I roll back to your early slides, back when I was in medical school, we didn't have quite this obesity epidemic. It was all hepatitis and it was all alcohol, right? I mean, those were, there were other causes, but those were the two big causes. And it seems like, obviously, we, we're curing hepatitis C now, so that's becoming more and more rare, but the obesity has gone up fast enough. We actually probably are doing more transplants now than we used to when we could have been in a situation if we didn't have obesity and fatty liver disease going the other way. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, the concerns we have for the rising obesity epidemic, and as we've talked about, this is heart, you have heart disease, f liver disease, uh, endocrine problems. Uh, actually, our orthopedists are seeing more and more patients with weight-based uh, orthopedic injuries. Um, it's, if we could uh, work to improve, which we're trying to do through the uh, Underwood Food Alliance, our understanding of weight and diet and use food as medicine as one of the terms that we've coined uh, recently to look at our diet as an integral part of our medical care. Um, moving forward, I hope that we can stop the uh, uh, rising rates of obesity because at this point, and especially here in Texas with our Hispanic community, it is continuing to accelerate, not decelerate at this point. No. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end with two questions. I think they're both gonna be for you, Dr. Quigley, because I wanna make sure I get to everybody's questions. Noisy stomach, um, <laughs> what are the causes and what meaning and prevention? And, and you know, we all know that you know, when your stomach, broadly, your, your intestines aren't, aren't behaving, don't feel well, boy, it's, it's 
pretty unhappy and miserable, which is, uh, we don't all like to talk about it too much, but it's a very, very common issue, obviously. So this is the one question I was hoping you would ask me, <laughs> because the term we use for it, I think is the best term in all of medicine, <laughs> is barbarigmy. And if that's not onomatopoeia, I don't know what is. So it's, a barbarigmy is a wonderful term because it describes exactly what's going on. Uh, for the most part, noisy stomach is probably means is benign. It is normal for our stomachs to rumble and to make, some, make a racket. Uh, it can be more prominent in some rather than others. And it's just basically a reflection of the products of digestion moving through your GI tract. That's all that's happening. If you've got narrowing in the GI tract, if you've got an obstruction, that may become more prominent. That's certainly, if you've got too much gas in your GI, in your GI tract, that can cause more, more rumbling. Or, or if you haven't done a great job at digesting and absorbing absorbing the contents of your of your of your food intake that may also cause rumbling. So for the most part I would say it's probably benign and of no importance uh, but it certainly uh, can be an indicator that some other things are going on. Great. Yeah, actually, I think in medical school, if I remember correctly, our, our uh, newsletter was called Borbridge <laughs> <Yeah, it's> and <laughs> the Rumblings. Um, so, uh, okay, one last question for you very quickly because we need to move on, but uh, I want to make sure I honor all the questions that came in. Can yeast go in the, grow in the gut and does that cause inflammation and can that cause kind of an external rash as well? This is a very common question. And one of the, th the first things I have to say is that it's, it's normal to have yeast in your GI tract. Candida, various species of candida, various other yeast are normal in the GI tract, so that's the first point. And there's a lot of hoopla and hullabaloo in, on the internet about uh, candida and all the things that can cause. For the most part, it's probably not a, not a factor. There are patients who've got immune deficiency, who've, got, uh, who've lost a lot of their bowel, who've got other diseases, who can get an overgrowth of candida, which can lead to symptoms and can be problematic. But for the most part, yeast is a benign, normal constituent of the gastrointestinal microbiome and something we need to worry about. Thank you. Well, that's a fascinating discussion with the three of you. I could go on for quite a while here, but uh, we are on the clock. So I'm going to give a quick presentation here on kind of overview of some things at Houston Methodist. As I promised, just a short COVID update uh, and then happy to take any other questions if you send them in. If not, uh, we'll end after that. Uh, so let me give you a, a quick update. I'll start with COVID. Um, we're in a really good spot right now, as you all have figured out. Thankfully, the, the, the last couple of meetings, I've been able to say that. And we're in a you know, sort of fairly steady state, um, certainly from a hospitalization, which is ultimately what we're most concerned about because that's where you get the really sick people. And that's where you obviously have people who sadly um, sometimes succumb to the disease. And so that has really maintained now in, in a consistent range for quite some time. As you see here, um, what you see in the blue bars is the number of tests positive, and then in the orange, that is the po percentage of positivity. You know, we're kind of uh, at uh, pretty much all time low average number of tests positive. Now, I put a huge caveat with that is now we have such availability of the uh, home tests that, you know, we're not seeing all of the positive tests. I and mean, I can tell you personally, you know, I, it's not infrequent that, you know, hey, I got a little stuffy nose, let me check a, a home test. And, that would have been me coming in, you know, to our lab and getting a PCR last year. And I know that's consistent. So, you know, keep that in mind a little bit. We're seeing some creep up of the positivity, but it's still at a pretty nice level, but it has crept up a little bit. But again, if you're not getting all those kind of minor coming in, it's a little hard to interpret that. We see consistent results across the Texas Medical Center. So what I kind of look at is I look at the hospitalizations, which are a little lagging, but I look for any signal as to whether we're seeing a turn in that, and we're not right now, um, thankfully, knock wood. And I look at wastewater, because um, that's really a pretty good leading indicator. And over time, more and more of the United States has picked this up. We've been doing this in Houston for a long, long time now. Um, here's a regional map of that over the last six weeks or so. And you can see it has been going up, actually, most notably in the Northeast, although has leveled off over the last couple of weeks. We'll, we'll watch that uh, closely. Of course, weather's been getting better. People have been moving outside. Some of those good kinds of dynamics that we've seen there. Locally, we're at a pretty good spot, um, but we are up. Um, we got as low as about 22% on how they, they measure this. Here you see how high it got during Omicron, very, very high, um, got nicely low. It's up, you know, 3x or so from where it was, but it's still a, f a very low number compared to, to many other times. And it is not, even with that increase, we're not seeing signal at the hospital level. So, you know, 
um, back to my same message of seize the moment safely, be ready to pivot. Um, you know, we don't see a reason that a pivot should be needed soon, knock wood. Um, but of course, nobody has a perfect crystal ball associated with that. We did see some recent data out of the CDC. I think it's 60 percent, six zero percent of adults United, in the United States have uh, antibody that they've acquired by getting the infection. Um, so you already have 60 percent if you had no vaccine out there. Um, you know, uh, with vaccine, of course, you've got you know depending what you're looking at, boosted, unboosted, you know, it's 60, 70 percent, depending where you are. Um, you know, so the bottom line is you know, virtually everybody, probably in the high 80s, 90 percent of people have antibody in their systems from one route or the other or both. Um, and so that is, I think, part of what we're seeing here as well. Um, and that's good news um, uh, in that, you know, that kind of holds back uh, severe disease. What we don't know is could a variant show up um, and could that cause a problem? And we don't know yet how badly immunity will wane over time and could that then cause a, a big upsurge? Here's you know all of the variant kind of that we always talk about. Right now we're dealing with this little family of Omicron, right? It went from Omicron and now a couple of subvariants have really taken, taken over, probably a little more infectious uh, and, uh, than Omicron was. Omicron markedly more infectious than the other variants. Uh, and that's really what I think we've dealt with. But of course, we've all had discussion about the milder nature of Omicron. Some of that, as we've talked about, is probably the virus itself. And much of that is what I just talked about in terms of immunity here. Right now, Knockwood, we don't really see cause for concern. But remember, you know, Omicron did not come from sort of a small little uh, mutation on something we knew. It was sort of brand new and showed up and showed up very, very rapidly. So there's always, unfortunately, that chance, but we're all crossing our fingers uh, that that will not be the case. Just to show you one recent study that came out, New England Journal of Medicine, um, so I can make a, a very key point with this. If you look to the right, that's Pfizer. Don't bother with the left because we don't really use uh, that in the U.S. because this is a British study. Um, but on the right, you see Pfizer. And what you see uh, is, is kind of uh, in the three areas there, you see kind of fresh after your second dose and then later after your second dose in the middle. And then to the right, you see after a booster. And in each of those pairs, the left is Delta and the right is Omicron. So what you see is if you have gone a good bit away from your second dose, from a point of getting infection, let me be clear, this is not death, this is not hospitalization, this is just infection, you, you almost have no immunity at that point against Omicron, but you can replace a great deal of that with a booster. And we've seen, as we've talked about many times before, significant uptick in protection against the really bad stuff, against hospitalization and death. Um, so if you haven't gotten your first booster, by all means, get your first booster. The second question I get constantly, of course, is about, do I get a second booster? Right now, the recommendation is age 50 and up at four months or greater after your first booster. Um, you, of course, should Discuss, if you have questions, discuss that with your physician. There's obviously a risk profile here. I mean, I guarantee you our, our transplant patients um, you know, need to have done that and in many cases have done other things uh, as well. I guess I'm kind of pragmatic about it now. I will tell you, I got mine about a month ago or so um, because it'd been long enough, A. B, I really still don't want to get it if I can avoid it. C, I want to keep my immunity up. D, I figure we're most likely going to need something, whether it's another booster or whether it's more specific to hit or prevent probably the seasonality we're going to see for, I would assume, the next few years, meaning you're going to be looking at an October-ish, November-ish you know, need for a booster. So now is about five, six months from that, so the timing's pretty good. So if you're in that age group, I would encourage you to go ahead and get boosted. That, that's certainly what, what my family has done. And, almost every physician here I know have done the same. Let me talk about a couple other nice updates at Houston Methodist. You know, last month I talked about full speed ahead on our Cypress Hospital. Well, part of the playbook we have is getting leadership in early as we start to develop those campuses. You can see uh, the actual uh, layout of the campus. If you drive by there now, you'll see lots of stuff getting uh, torn down and demolitioned. Um, very happy to say that Trent Fulin um, has uh, been named our CEO, um, a great internal promotion. He's been with us for about five years, has great experience starting up a hospital, has been our chief operating officer at the Woodlands Hospital and actually helped build the Woodlands Hospital.
hospital. So he brings a lot of great experience to that. So huge kudos to him, and that will enable us to move that very quickly. And then just this month, we actually approved this at the board a couple months ago, but you know, had a lot of dominoes that needed to happen before we started the project. Uh, and over the past week, we've put up all the fencing around where the project's going to go up, and we announced our Centennial Tower. This is a $1.4 billion project. That's, that's all in. That's the building as well as equipping the building. 26 stories, so it's taller than Walter Tower, and you can see two different views there of how it sort of uh, interacts with Walter Tower. Connected really on all the patient floors to help flow, particularly for the people who work in the institution. Most people who've ever worked in a hospital know it's always a story of, you know, you go down this elevator, you connect on that floor, you go up that elevator, not in these buildings. It is going to be completely connected, which is really beneficial. A beautiful rooftop garden is part of this. And probably the thing I'm most excited about is this completely replaces our emergency room. Our emergency room is in our old building. It's really been nowhere else to move it. We've expanded it. We've kind of reached the limits of ability to expand it. This will have way more emergency room beds, but also bigger rooms, lots bigger space. It's going to be so nice. Um, this whole project will be open in about uh, five years. In 2027, we will have this open in stages. So incredibly excited about that. About 400 beds in it, about 175 new, new beds to account for significant growth that we continue to experience. Now, one of the ways we drive all the excellence you've seen, the Underwood Center, all of our other centers of excellence, um, uh, is through philanthropy. And we finally got to celebrate the end of our second campaign. I say, I laugh and I say finally because we've rescheduled this event three, four times because of COVID. Um, we actually finished this campaign and it was a $500 million campaign two years early in the middle of COVID, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, at the end of 2020, um, it was a $500 million campaign raised $518 million. And we had this celebration event and right below the mosaic with the extending arms of Christ in uh, the Bush atrium, there is now a carved donor wall for all donors who gave over a quarter of a million dollars during this time, over 200 names. Um, had just this beautiful event to celebrate. Every donor at over 50,000 will actually have their name on an acrylic that's about to go up just to the side of that. And so it's, it's really stunningly beautiful. Great event. We had, over, we had 3,186 donors in total during the campaign. Um, I have to give a shout out, of course, to the transformational gift for the Walter Tower, um, which now we're adding a Centennial Tower uh, as a companion to that. But of course, to Paula and Rusty Walter for their um, dedication to this institution, their love of this institution, our love of them, uh, and really driving and catalyzing so much of that uh, uh, project and, and that campaign. Elizabeth Waring, who you see pictured there with Paula, and Rusty Walter were the co-chairs of the campaign, so they both provided tremendous leadership, and we are so incredibly grateful to them. Uh, and uh, I want to give a special shout out to Emily Crosswell as well, who helped plan the event, helped us all work on designing this beautiful wall. So when you get a chance, come by, take a look at this. It, it really is quite stunning. And while we're on that topic, we have great momentum on what is a quiet phase for the next inevitable campaign that, that also does support all of this wonderful work. We received in the last month a $50 million anonymous commitment, the second largest gift we've ever received in our history. The beautiful thing about this is it's structured to really match and catalyze a lot of other efforts. And so it has a philanthropic impact of about almost $155 million. So a uh, huge thank you to our anonymous donor. Um, for uh, that wonderful uh, commitment moving us forward. And then another donation we literally just announced uh, this week um, is an $11 million donation from Jim and Carol Walter Luke. Uh, as you see, it supports a whole array of different activities here. Really nice. I highlighted in red there one of those gifts is in honor of uh, Carol's uh, brother. Jim's brother-in-law, Rusty Walter. Um, we're thrilled with that. And another gift in honor of their, their mother. And so um, again, incredibly grateful to them. The momentum we have uh, is absolutely wonderful. Last year, 2021, the first year of this next campaign was actually our second biggest fundraising ever. It was about $98 million in the, in, in the year. Uh, and uh, with these two gifts this year, uh, we think we may hit our best year ever. We certainly will pass our second best year ever um, without a doubt. And so we are just so incredibly grateful um, to, to each and every one of those. Um, so with that, I'm 
thank you, and I'm going to wrap things up. I do see one question that came uh, in, um, and the question is, what are your thoughts about using Moderna for your fourth shot if you've used Pfizer for the first three? So this is the mix and match strategy that people are asking about. Um, we don't have a crystal clear answer to that. Um, I'll tell you what I did personally. I had three doses of Pfizer and I said, what the heck, we have Moderna and Pfizer available and I got a Moderna shot for my fourth shot. There's some indication that some mixing and matching may be good. There's certainly solid, robust evidence that says mixing and matching is just as good. Um, so for me personally, I saw no downside, only upside said, you know, why not give that a try? Um, but that's a, a little bit of a personal choice and I wouldn't, you know, sort of like plan my whole life around that because it's, it, it's, it's unclear. We don't know that for sure. So I mo much more importantly, get whatever's available. If you can only get one or the other, go get one or the other right now. But it really does need to be one of the mRNA vaccines here at this point in time. So it should be one or the other. And again, um, I kind of consider them equivalent and there may be some benefit to a mix and match strategy. I think that's the only questions I've seen come in. So I want to thank uh, my colleagues here uh, for joining me today, Dr. Dr. Quigley, Dr. Caesar, uh, and uh, Dr. Victor. Um, uh, Y'all are all amazing. We're so very uh, grateful to each of you. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Irani, who's been taking uh, questions. And I'm sure, as I've seen in all these others, probably typing fast and furiously. I'd also like to thank Rob Fondren, uh, our co-chair, who gave the uh, uh, introduction today along with Duncan Underwood who co-chairs the GI Council and of course all the members of the GI Council. If that's an area of interest for you that you'd like to get involved in, we'd love to hear from you. So just let us know and contact us. Now next month um, we're going to continue uh, our plan to have uh, a wide array of topics uh, here and we will focus on women's health. Very appropriate in the month that we will celebrate Mother's Day. I think it will come uh, May 26th, so Mother's Day will come before that. So for all of our mothers, uh, happy Mother's Day in, in I guess about uh, uh, 10 days, two weeks, something like that. And I will look forward to seeing you in a month. God bless.